Father, we come to you this evening. You have been with us all day today. Our spirits have been lifted. Our hearts have been touched. And Father, we have been invigorated on this, thy holy Sabbath. Father, as we convene now, this final evening, we have not the final evening of the session, but this final meeting of the day, the evening meeting. Father, we have been richly blessed. This has been a spiritual feast for those who are willing to receive it. And Father, as we, as we come together now, we need a special message from heaven. I pray, Father, that as we advance now to the third central element of the Christian faith, redemption, that Your Spirit will be with us in a special way. Father, take away the distractions and difficulties of the world, and may our focus be entirely and completely on Christ, Him crucified and Him risen. Be with us now, Lord. Condescend to come into this room. Speak through this humble servant that a message may be delivered, not because of Him, but in spite of Him. Father, we would see Jesus, so show Him to us now through the pages of Your Word, through the person of Your Spirit. In Jesus' name, let all God's friends say, Amen. Amen. We continue our series four for faith, and I'd just like to quickly review with you what we're doing in this series. We are looking at the four central elements of the Christian faith. Revelation, that is that God has revealed Himself. Resurrection, and that is that God was incarnate, literally enfleshed in the person of Christ, that He died and that He rose again. And last night we looked at some of the historical and factual evidences for the resurrection of Christ. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Tonight we're going to be looking at redemption and tomorrow. The four central questions of the human experience are these. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, where am I from? Meaning, why am I here? Morality, how should I live? And destiny, where am I going? And I'm proposing that the best, most cogent, most coherent answer to those four central consensus questions of humanity is in fact the Christian truth. The Christian what did I say, everyone? Truth. Not the Christian preference, not the Christian option, but the Christian truth. Now, our first evening, we talked about the existence of God. How do we know that, in fact, God does exist? And we looked at these five words, and we sort of unpacked those five words. Time, life, mind, ought, friend. We reviewed that last night, and so we're going to move on to this evening, or last night's message, which was on the resurrection. Remember this statement? We looked at it just quickly last night from Wolfhart Pannenberg. He says, The resurrection of Jesus acquires such decisive meaning, not merely because someone or anyone has been raised from the dead, but because it is Jesus of Nazareth, whose execution was instigated by the Jews because he had blasphemed against God. If this man was raised from the dead, then plainly that means that the God whom he had supposedly blasphemed had committed himself to him. The resurrection can only be understood as the divine vindication of the man whom the Jews had rejected as a blasphemer. Now, if that statement makes sense, I want you to say amen. Very simple. Remember, simple. Last night, we we quoted from G.B. Hardy's book, Countdown, in which he said there are only two essential requirements. Number one, has anyone ever cheated death? And number two, is it available to me? Let us survey the historical record, said Mr. Hardy. Buddha's tomb, occupied. Confucius' tomb, occupied. Muhammad's tomb, occupied. Jesus' tomb, empty. And he added this postscript, argue as you may, but for me and my purposes, there is no point in following a what? Do you remember? A loser. Now, we don't mean loser in the pejorative sense, but simply this, that every single individual has lost the battle to death. Lost the battle to what, everyone? Death. But here is Christ. Jesus Christ on the landscape of human history who stands alone as victor and triumphant over death. So I want to know, has anyone cheated death? Just as Mr. Hardy wanted to know. And is it available to me? And the answer compellingly is yes. And we asked the question last night, Jesus is alive. This is a historical fact. And the Bible is alive. And we we made the appeal, is this a personal fact? Our messages so far have addressed the issue of theism, that is the existence of God, then the truthfulness of the Christian claims, that is in the resurrection of Christ. And this evening we're going to look at the issue of redemption. So we have revelation, resurrection, and redemption. God, are you there? Do you care? The Word alive and kicking in our message tonight, the Sabbath, the rest of the story. Tonight we're addressing the word redemption. And the root word of redemption is redeem. It's what, everyone? Redeem. Now you look the word redeem up in the dictionary and it means to buy back, 
to ransom, to give in exchange for. This is a central theme in the New Testament. Redeem, the root word of redemption, means to buy back or give in exchange for. We have several passages up here that we're just going to look at quickly. The first I'd like to turn your attention to is the third one there on the list, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Go with me to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Matthew 20, verse 28. Our message is entitled, The Sabbath, The Rest of the Story. We're talking this evening about redemption. Redemption means to buy back. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Are we there, everyone? Yes or no? Verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, notice this now, and to give His life as a what? A ransom for a few. To give His life as a ransom for many. Now notice that word ransom there. This is not a difficult word to understand. If, if someone has been kidnapped, if someone has been taken captive and they say, I will release this individual to you for a ransom, what function does the word ransom serve here? The word ransom means price. It means what, everyone? Price. And in fact, if you actually substitute the word price there in the context, it makes perfectly good sense. Look at verse 28 again. But to serve and to give his life as a price for many. So the word redeem means to buy back. When we're speaking of purchasing something or buying something, the question that, that, that necessarily comes up is what's the cost? And Jesus here says in the plainest language, to purchase humanity back, I couldn't use silver and gold and money. I had to use my own life. In fact, that's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at that with me if you can. Get there quickly, 1 Peter chapter 1, and notice with me verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. The apostle Peter says, knowing that you were not redeemed. There's our word. Knowing that you were not redeemed, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, with corruptible things like what, everyone? Silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. You could just easily insert sin. You were not redeemed from sin with silver and gold. But what were we redeemed with then? Verse 19, but with the precious, what, everyone? Blood of Christ. Now, no, notice this. Hang on to this. As of a, what's the next word? Lamb, as of a what, everyone? Lamb. Now take that and put that on a shelf on your, in your mind because we're going to come back to that. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Peter here says we were redeemed, we were purchased, we were bought back. But what were we bought back with? The blood of Jesus. That sounds just like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The Son of Man came to give His life as a ransom, a purchase price to redeem many. Now, you're still there in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at chapter 3 and verse 18. You stay right there in the same book, chapter 3, verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. Notice this now. The just for the what, everyone? the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. The just for the unjust. There's that redemption. There's that exchange. There's that purchase price paid. The just, that is the righteous Christ, giving his life for the unjust, that is the unrighteous you and me. And notice Revelation, last book of the New Testament, easy to find, Revelation chapter 5. Here we find this marvelous chapter. We enter right into the very throne room of heaven. And in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 7, we find this. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Verse 8, now when he had taken the scroll, he being Christ, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, here's the song that is sung to Christ at His coronation. Verse 9, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Notice it now. For or because you were slain and have, what's the next word? Redeemed us to God by your what, everyone? by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So this is a consistent theme in the New Testament. 
In Matthew chapter 20, redeemed, ransomed. 1 Peter chapter 1, redeemed with what? With the blood. Revelation chapter 5, written by John, redeemed with what? With the blood. We sometimes sing there's power in the blood. Well, why is there power in the blood? There is a variety of reasons, no doubt. But one of them is, it's the very life and the very death of Jesus that was the purchase price for sinful humanity. Now, hang on to that. Redemption is necessary. Notice the screen. Because humanity, by nature, thought, word, and deed are the captives of sin, Satan, and death. Humanity has, has quite literally been taken captive by sin and by Satan and by death. And God looked down from heaven and He saw the sad situation there with Adam, the representative of the human race in the, in the Garden of Eden, and He said, this will never do. I will have to purchase, buy back my children, my estranged, captive children. The wages of sin is what, everyone? And how many of us have sinned? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so, if we are to be saved, then we must be bought back from our rightful captors. Now, if this makes sense, say amen. This is basic Christian theology. Basic orthodoxy when it comes to the purchase or the redemption of humanity by Christ. Now, you ask the question, but what does this have to do with the Sabbath? <laughs> After all, the message is entitled, The Sabbath. But notice the postscript, the rest of the story. How many of you are raised Seventh-day Adventists? Raise your hand. Keeping the Sabbath. All right. I didn't have that privilege. But my children do. Can someone say Amen. amen. And there are unique challenges that I am not experientially familiar with, but I have observed. Unique challenges with being raised a Seventh-day Adventist. And it goes something like this. You're told all your life, we have the truth, we have the truth, we have the truth, we have the truth. And in those teen years, in those early 20s, you have to wrestle with this question, is what my parents say right? And you really have two options at that point. You can either reject religion because many people, unfortunately, reject the Seventh-day Adventist truth just because their parents are recommending it. Well, this is hardly wise. Others are going to ask themselves the question, is what my parents believe sound and true? And this is what many people that are raised in the Seventh-day Adventist faith wrestle with. They, they need to make this great truth their own. Can someone say amen? Amen. Your parents' faith does benefit you, but there comes a time where you have to get out of the nest and flap on your own and decide, do I believe this? And I would recommend that you don't believe it based on the charisma of a speaker. You have to believe this by sitting down and using your own mind and your own Bible and actually doing some study. Can someone say amen? Amen. When I was in college, we studied for tests. Beloved, there is a test coming, a judgment test. And if you're going to believe this message, you have got to know for yourself if it's true. Because the faith of your pastor, the faith of your parents, the faith of your favorite speaker, even the faith of the person sitting next to you will not do. You need your own faith. So you're raised keeping the Sabbath. You don't fill the car up with gas on Sabbath. You get the dry cleaning done on Friday. All of these things that you, you don't do on the Sabbath. For many people, the Sabbath has become a day of don'ts. How many people want to raise their hand and say, yeah, that was how I was raised. It was a day of don'ts. Well, I got some news for you. It is a day of don'ts, but it's not only a day of don'ts. Can someone say amen? amen. Nothing wrong with some don'ts. Listen, you get married and you enter into a relationship of don'ts. But it's not just a relationship of don'ts. Do you understand the distinction, yes or no? If we tell our young people only, you can't do this and you can't do this and you can't do this and you can't do this, we have failed. What we need to say is we can do this and we can do this and we can do this. And the way that you set this all up is by knowing what the Sabbath 
is about. The reason that many of us are nonplussed about the Sabbath is that we don't really know what it's about. It's a day of don'ts. And so our message tonight is the Sabbath, the rest of the story. Again, what does this have to do with redemption? Everything. The answer? Everything. Now, wait a minute. I thought we were talking about redemption, Pastor. It sounds like you're preaching two sermons. If you're thinking that, the only reason you're thinking that is that you don't know what the Sabbath is really about. Every Seventh-day Adventist person, young person, should have ingrained into the very fiber of their being that the Sabbath and redemption go hand in hand. Amen. I'm going to try to show that to you this evening. By God's grace, we will have success. Let us note that redemption is central to the Old Testament as well. Sometimes we have this view that the God of the Old Testament is the mean God and the God of the New Testament is the nice God. Beloved, there is grace in the Old Testament and there is wrath in the New Testament. Are you with me, yes or no? The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God and I read in Acts that Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead. There's wrath in the New Testament and there's grace in the Old Testament. Redemption is not just a New Testament concept. Redemption is rooted into the very fiber of the Old Testament. Amen. Of special note are the books of Leviticus, Psalms, and Isaiah. Notice with me Exodus chapter 15. Go there with me. Exodus chapter 15. God's people had been in abject Egyptian slavery and poverty for a protracted period of time, some 400 years. And it came time for God to call His people out. And so He raised up a Midianite shepherd by the name of Moses and He appeared to him in a burning bush and He said, go down and tell that rascal Pharaoh to let my people go. They're captive. I'm going to buy them back. I want my people back and I'm willing to pay the price. Go get my people, Moses. You know the story, Moses went in, he said, you need to let the, the, the Israelites go and, and uh, Pharaoh was not easily persuaded in the first plague, the second plague, the third plague, hardening his heart, hardening his heart, and finally the tenth plague and the death of Pharaoh's own son. He acquiesced and relented and let the people go. As they're leaving... They come to a place where there's a mountain on the left and, and a mountain on the right and an impassable sea before them. Perhaps you've heard the joke before, but I want to say it just again because there are many intelligent people, scholars in our midst who in their intelligence have left the simpleness of the faith of Christ. I got no problem saying that either. The Apostle Paul goes so far as to say that some people professing themselves to be wise actually become fools. A degree is not a ticket to wisdom, and somebody ought to say amen. amen. Now, the best of both worlds is when you have the degree and you have the wisdom and you retain that simpleness of faith. But there are some people with their elevated in various degrees, they actually begin to doubt biblical revelation. And they work for the church. It's a crime of the highest order, robbery in the sight of God. And there's a story of a man who was sitting there and, and uh, he was reading and he was a brand new convert and, and he was reading the story of, of, of the crossing of the Red Sea and he just spontaneously, extemporaneously shouted, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! <laughs> there was a skeptical, atheistic-minded individual walking by and he heard that and he was immediately taken by it. And so he walked over, he said, pardon me, sir, I, I heard you say hallelujah, praise the Lord. Uh, pray tell, what are you reading? Oh, I'm reading the Bible, he says. And, and well, what have, what have you read in the Bible that elicited this, uh, this rambunctious response? He says, well, I, I just read that God parted the Red Sea and the children of Israel walked through on dry ground. I, I just had to say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, the way that God comes through in those tough times, those difficult times. And, and the atheist was absolutely nonplussed about this simpleton's naivete. And he said, come on. You really believe these fairy tales, these fictitious ideologies? He said, that's not the Red Sea. It's the Sea of Reeds. It's a six-inch deep swamp. They walked across it. Come on, how can you be so naive? How can you be so simple-minded? Well, the Christian wasn't real pleased with that, and, and uh, he was 
a little dejected, no doubt. And, and the atheist, in, in his pomposity, sort of walked away feeling good about himself that he had put this simpleton in his place and he hadn't gotten half, half the block down the street and he heard, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Well, he immediately rushed right back to see what could have possibly happened that would have so quickly rejuvenated the spirits of this Christian. And uh, he, I, I thought I just talked to you about this book, this fairy tale book. How could you so quickly be saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord? He said, sir, you're not going to believe this, but the entire Egyptian army just drowned in six inches of water. <laughs> Except you become as... Little children, beloved, the Christian faith is not an anti-intellectual faith. Can someone say amen? amen. You have seen that in the first two presentations. The, 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 the Christian faith is intellectually, philosophically, existentially compelling, but in your desire to understand the big, great, philosophically sound things of God, don't lose your simpleness. Don't lose your simplicity. I'm all four degrees. Praise the Lord. You want to get an education? Get an education. I have a PhD. I'm preparing for heaven daily. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a degree, beloved, but don't become so wise that you become a fool. You with me? So they've gone across the Red Sea. Of course, the, the Egyptian armies there are drowned in that six inches of water. And they get to the other side and they sing a song. Notice verse 11. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Here's the song, the song of Moses. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth, notice this now, the people whom you have, what's the next word? redeemed you have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation Sinai the Israelites understood Miriam understood Moses understood we've been redeemed we've been rescued we've been bought back we've been purchased Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 7 and 8 notice that with me fifth book of the Old Testament by the way I don't like calling it the Old Testament because it sounds so old Old sounds outdated. I prefer to refer to it as the New Testament and then the Newer Testament. You like that, Dick? You like that. Okay, I thought you would. The New Testament and the Newer Testament. So Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the New Testament. Verse 7, The Lord did not send His love on you nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other peoples, for you were the least of all peoples, verse 8, but because the Lord loves you and because He would keep the oath which He swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. It's not something we sing only in the church dispensation. Not something we sing only since the time of Christ. Even Moses, even Abraham, even Isaac, even Jacob, even Isaiah could sing, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Many other texts could be cited. Now remember, don't miss this. Before, you notice that word is in italics. Before, what's the word, everyone? Before. Before the children of Israel were led to Mount Sinai to hear the commandments. That is the moral exhortations of God. Before they got to Mount Sinai, they were first taught the institution of the what? The Passover. The importance of this cannot be overstated. The Passover lamb represented who, beloved? Jesus Christ. Now think about this. The first plague comes, the second plague, the third plague. We get to the tenth plague, which is the death of the firstborn. And God sends instructions to Moses. He said, take a lamb, bring that lamb into your house and take care of that lamb for three days. And at the end of those three days, that lamb must be killed and it will be eaten very quickly with bread that has no yeast in it. Why no yeast? Because yeast takes time to rise. They had to move quickly. And take the blood from that lamb and put it on the doorposts. And when the angel of death comes passing through the Egyptian night, he will see the blood on the doorposts as a symbol of the blood 
of Christ. Remember I told you to take the word lamb and put it on a shelf in your mind? Take it off the shelf now. What did Peter say? You are redeemed with not silver and gold, corruptible things such as these, but with the blood of Jesus as of a lamb. What did John the Baptist say? There standing up to, the, the, to his waist in the muddy waters of the River Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as that angel of death would go gli gliding through the, the city and, and the firstborn of the Egyptians were being slain, why? They didn't have the blood. See, beloved, the Passover is just exactly that. It's when the sentence of death passed over God's people. Why? Because of the blood of the Lamb. Now, beloved, don't miss the sequence. Don't miss the chronology. What comes first? The Passover comes first and then Mount Sinai. Can someone say amen? amen. Beloved, this should forever solve the question of, of righteousness by faith and how obedience fits into that. First, they were taught the glorious institution of the Passover, righteousness by faith in the blood of the Lamb, and then they heard the moral exhortations of God, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, etc., etc. Do you see the sequence there, yes or no? Yes. Beloved, you can't keep the commandments unless you have faith in Christ, present faith in a present Savior. Yes. <laughs> Many people are trying to obey the moral exhortations of God without the confidence that they are presently forgiven by that same God. What good is your commandment keeping? All of the commandment keeping in the world cannot recommend you to a holy God. Your righteousnesses are like filthy rags, beloved. Your Sabbath keeping isn't going to cut it. It's the righteousness of Christ that recommends you to God and your Sabbath keeping, your obedience, your abstinence from adultery and stealing and sin. Those things do not recommend you to God. They're the proof that you have believed in God Amen. and in His Savior. Nothing wrong with works, but we need to put works on the proper side of the equation. If we've got works over on this side of the equation, faith and works. And by the way, there is no such thing as faith and works. Not in the Christian faith. Faith which works. Do you hear the difference? If it's faith and works, then what we say is, oh, it's important what Jesus did. And I'm so thankful for what Jesus did. And I'll mix in a little bit of my own spice. And now Jesus plus me equals salvation. <laughs> Danger. Beloved, I put my faith in Christ and Christ's substitutionary death and perfect life becomes my death and my life and I'm saved. How is it said there by John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12? He that has the Son has life and he that has not the Son has not life. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now that I am in a saving relationship with Christ by faith, obedience will be the fruit of that relationship. Can someone say amen? So obedience is the fruit, not the root. Are you with me? Obedience is not the ground of my salvation. It's the result of my salvation. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, first of all, I've read the New Testament. And second of all, the Passover precedes Mount Sinai. Are you with me on that? Yes or no? Oh, sure. Sure you are. The Sabbath located right in the heart of the Ten Commandments is a sign of both creation and redemption. Exodus chapter 20. Let's go there. Let's go look at those moral exhortations of God. Exodus chapter 20. God has redeemed His people. He's purchased His people. The Passover has been instituted. And here they come, a ragtag, motley crew band of <laughs> stiff-necked, obstinate individuals. They arrive at the foot of Mount Sinai. God has some moral exhortations for His people. We call these moral exhortations the Ten Commandments. Look at the fourth. Beginning in verse 8, Remember the what, everyone? Sabbath day to keep it holy. You don't make it holy, you keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your uh, stranger who is within your gates. Why? Verse 11, for or because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. 
Here God says, keep my Sabbath holy because it's a sign and a symbol of creation. A sign and a symbol of what, everyone? Creation. Creation. And some people wonder, what can I and what can't I do on the Sabbath? Beloved, I'm going to give you three principles of Sabbath keeping. Piece of cake. You don't, need a, you don't need a list of, of 125 things that you can't do and, and, and 4,362 things you can do. There are simple, three simple principles of Sabbath keeping. Number one, you don't work. Is that clear in the commandment? Yes or no? Yeah. Thou shalt do no labor. It means whatever you do that earns you a paycheck on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, you don't do that on the Sabbath. Is that clear from the commandment, yes or no? So number one, you don't work. And number two, are you ready for this? I hope you are. You don't cause others to work. That makes good sense, doesn't it? Listen, I don't steal. And it would be equally wrong for me to go to you and say, hey, would you steal for me? Because I'm a Christian and I can't steal. (laughs) Notice it says the stranger that is within your gates. That means the people over whom you have power. Now you listen to me. (laughs) Some people ask the question, is it okay to go out and eat on the Sabbath? What a silly question. All you have to ask is this question. Do people have to work for you if you go out to eat? Yes or no? So you are causing other people to work. And that violates the second principle of the Ten Commandments there. The the fourth commandment. Number one, you don't work. Number two, you don't cause others to work. That's why you take care of all those preparatory things before. Friday is called the day of preparation. Are we on the same page? Yes or no? Very simple. Rule number one or principle number one, you don't work. Principle number two, you don't cause others to work. And number three, the activity in which you are engaging, engaging, you must be able to say in the honesty and integrity and sincerity of your heart that this activity is leading you closer to Christ as your creator and redeemer. Oh, you say, but Pastor Ashrick, that sounds dangerous. That sounds like I have to think. You're right. You're exactly right. Beloved, don't ask me or any other pastor to write you out a prescription of what is and is not acceptable on the Sabbath. Beloved, that's what the Pharisees got themselves into trouble with. They hedged themselves in so tightly that the Sabbath became a day of don'ts like it has for some of you. Beloved, the third principle of Sabbath keeping is so simple. The activity in which you are engaging, you must be able to say in the sincerity of your heart, this activity is leading me closer to Jesus, my Creator and my Redeemer. And if you can answer that question in the affirmative, that activity is... It's okay on the Sabbath. And you know what? This is going to be radical. What works for you may be different than what works for me. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You don't have to answer for what I do. And I don't have to answer for what you do. Are you with me, yes or no? Well, this sounds kind of dangerous. It sounds like we're actually leaving it up to the people to think for themselves as to whether or not a certain activity actually leads them closer to their Lord as as Creator and Redeemer. You're exactly right. And beloved, I'm going to say something here. Your Sabbath experience and the things you're comfortable doing and not comfortable doing is going to change in the course of your Christian experience. As you grow, your appreciation of the Sabbath will grow and it just may be the case that certain things you used to do on the Sabbath become uncomfortable. But not because someone said to you, you can't do such a thing, but because you have have analyzed it and you have thought about it and you have drawn the conclusion, this is not healthy for me and my relationship with Christ as Creator and Redeemer. Make sense? Yes or no? Three principles. Number one, you don't work. Number two, you don't work. And number three, the activity in which you are engaging, you can say in the sincerity and authenticity of your heart, this activity is leading me closer to Christ as my Creator and Redeemer. Simple. So the Sabbath is a sign of creation. What else is the Sabbath a sign of? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is the recapitulation of the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5. That's in the New Testament. Amen? Amen. You're with me. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 12. Here is the recapitulation of the, the Ten Commandments. The word Deuteronomy actually means the second reading or the second rendering of the law. Namos is law. Du is two. The second law. 
Verse 12, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Verse 13, six days you shall work and do all your, or labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your ox nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Now up to this point, it's basically identical. But notice what happens in verse 15. And remember that you were a what, everyone? You were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Isn't this interesting? The commandment up to this point has been identical, but here Moses actually changes the reason for the keeping of the Sabbath. Now, this does not negate the former reason for keeping the Sabbath. You know that, incidentally, because Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath before there even was such a thing as the Ten Commandments, that is, the codified Ten Commandments, before there ever was such a thing as a Jew. And so you know that the Sabbath will always be a sign of creation, a sign of what, everyone? But Moses here, he enlarges on it. He exposits on the beauty of the Sabbath commandment, and he says, don't forget you were redeemed. And here the Sabbath takes on a redemptive component as well. Not just as a symbol of creation past, but as a powerful symbol of redemption present. Amen. The Sabbath becomes a sign of both creation and redemption. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12, it's, it's spelled right out. Ezekiel chapter 20, you'll find that in the New Testament toward the end of the New Testament. Find the major prophets there. Ezekiel chapter 20. And notice verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who uh, sanctifies them or sets them apart. I'm the one who makes them holy. Here the Sabbath clearly has a, a salvational, redemptive component. The Sabbath is a sign that you can't make yourself holy. It's God that makes you holy. Can someone say amen to that? The Sabbath is a sign that it's, that it's God who sanctifies us. Just as Israel was redeemed from their captors and oppressors in Egypt so too we must be redeemed, that is, bought back from our captors and oppressors, sin, Satan, and death. Anyone want to be vulnerable here tonight and say that sometimes sin looks attractive? <laughs> we wouldn't sin if it didn't have a sugar coating on it, would we? And the devil is, is such a liar. He promises life and he promises sweetness and he promises fulfillment and he promises satisfaction and he always delivers death. You've heard bait and switch. Bait and switch is where one product is advertised and you get in the store and they say, oh, we're sorry, so we're out of that product, but we have this product. They've baited you with one and they've switched it at the last moment. Satan does that very thing. He holds out these various and sundry temptations that look good, that look appealing, that look sweet, and when you take them, they are bitter in the belly. The devil delivers only death. He's not interested in you. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. If Jesus comes so that you can have life, the devil wants you to have what? Death. But he masquerades it as life. Think of smoking. My mother started smoking when she was 16. She quit two years ago. Praise God. But look at these ridiculous smoking advertisements just as a case in point. Yeah. All the girls flocking around you because you're the Marlboro man. And, and uh, they, they, they sort of, this sophisticated, avant-garde, shay lifestyle, complete with cigarette. The advertisements are lying. This is what is promised, but it is not what is delivered. They don't show you the pictures of the people who have holes in their throat and who are hooked up to ventilators and who are... <laughs> trying to smoke. I've actually seen people smoke through that hole in their throat. They had to have a, a terrible operation and they still didn't quit. They smoked through the hole in the throat. I'd like to see them put that up as an advertisement. 
See, what's promised is not what's delivered. The devil promises life and he delivers death. You get involved in a relationship and, and it, one thing's going, it's going a little faster than you thought, but, but you see you love this person and, and after all, he's so nice and he's so sweet and, and you're looking for companionship and before you know it, you're pregnant. Hadn't planned on that. Beloved, listen to me. God has your best interest in mind. Can someone say amen? It's God that promises life. If we look at God's Ten Commandments and they seem restrictive, it's only because of the carnality of our hearts. We need a change of heart so that we can appreciate God's law. God has your best interest in mind. I remember when I was a young boy, maybe five or six years old, I was crawling around in the kitchen and I found this shiny green can under the kitchen sink and it had this sparkly powder in it. And I began to put the sparkly powder all over the kitchen floor and I, I reached down, I took a scoop of it and I went, ah, and just about that time, my mom came in and went, whack, just like that. And the stuff goes everywhere. Of course, I was about ready to eat some Ajax. Now, wh why did my mom act so, so quickly? Why did she act so abruptly? Why did I receive punishment? Because she hates me? Because she knows that what I'm about ready to consume will kill me. Beloved, just trust God. Amen. You say, oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I like this music. I like this entertainment. I don't see what's wrong with it. C.D. Brooks tells the marvelous story. He was interviewing a young lady. She was saying, well, I don't see what's wrong with dancing. I don't see what's wrong with jewelry. And I don't see what's wrong with, with drinking. And I don't see what's wrong with having premarital sex. And I don't see. And, and, and Elder Brooks finally said, sister, can't you hear yourself? Your problem is you can't see. The law of God becomes a delight when we're converted. If it looks restrictive, it's because God doesn't have our heart. But when God has the heart, I'm going to say something radical here. Religion becomes fun. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Listen, beloved, you won't meet a more joy-filled, fun-filled, desiring a fun person than me. I mean, of all the people in this room, you might be as well, but it would be a tie for first. I mean, I used to do the, the, the punk rock thing and the skateboarding thing and the rock climbing thing and the adventure thing and the extreme sports thing. And I remember when I became converted, I literally thought in my mind, well, here goes a life of boredom, but I'm going to tough it out for Jesus. Literally, I literally thought, you know, this is the end of life, but at least I get to live forever. I mean, really? Who wants to live forever if life is going to be a ho-hum and boring? Amen. Amen. But beloved, you know what happened? God started to change my heart. So the things that I thought would be absolutely, entirely, completely boring became a joy. Amen. And the things that I used to thought were a joy, I know this is going to sound incredible, they became repulsive, many of them. Oh, I used to swear like a sailor. Every other word was the wrong word. It was a four-letter word. And uh, I'll tell you a true story. When I became a Christian overnight, literally, when I gave my heart to Jesus, June 6, 1996, literally, I stopped swearing from that day forward. It just, God just took it from me. Before that, if I would have tried to stop swearing, impossible. I could go maybe 15 minutes without swearing. And then just suddenly, I found swearing to be... Repulsive. I found it to be ignorant. I found it to be foolish. And, and I wanted to have nothing to do with it. God just took it from me. Amen. Friends, if you'll give... Be honest with God. Tell Him you like your sin. Don't pretend like you don't like it. He knows you like it. So tell Him. Say, Lord, I like this thing. But I want you. Better yet, I give you permission to help me not like it. That's, you, don't, you don't have to do it. You just have to be willing to be willing. God will take care of that. You say, Lord, here it is. I enjoy these things, but I am willing to not enjoy them. But you're going to have to do it, Lord. You're going to have to work in me to willing to do according to your good pleasure. And I'm telling you, beloved, a change will start to take place within you. Are you hearing me, yes or no? And the things you thought were boring become exciting and joy-filled and fun-filled. And the things you used to thought were so grand, you used to think were so grand, can literally become repulsive. I used to be married to my punk rock music. It was my life. I thought it would be impossible for me to live without my music. 
I played in a punk rock band for seven years. It wasn't just a fancy with me. I loved it. My battery's dying here. Can you help me out, Emil? I loved this stuff. I mean, in a way that, that it's difficult to describe. It was part of who I was. It was literally physically impossible for me to start disliking my music on my own. And I'll be honest with you, it didn't happen overnight. Not the music thing. The swearing thing was gone just like that. But the music thing took a little while. Do you know what God convicted me to do? And I'm going to recommend it to you. God convicted me to fast from all music for a period of several months. I, I just, I felt like I couldn't evaluate it honestly. And so I just said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go without all music. But instead of trying to decide what's kosher and what's not kosher, what's sanctified and what's not sanctified, I'm just going to take a break from all music. I took a break from all music except for what was being sung in church for two or three or four months. I don't remember precisely how long it was. I did no music. I felt like I needed to cleanse the system. I, I needed to get a different perspective, a new perspective. And all the while I'm praying, God, show me your will on this music thing because you know I love this music. And, and I, hey, listen, I was all about starting a Christian punk rock band. I mean, I, I would have loved that. I mean, I would have loved that. And over that process of fasting and giving it to God, God revealed to me plainly, plainly, that this music could not be done to His honor and glory. And He took it away from me. He did. But I had to give it to Him. I had to do that fast. I had to turn it over to Him. Beloved, we need to be bought back from our captors and our oppressors. What, what's oppressing you? Maybe you listen to me talking about punk rock music and it sounds foolish to you, but maybe it's internet pornography with you. Maybe it's an inappropriate premarital relationship with you. Maybe it's pride with you. Maybe it's gossip with you. Don't tell me that there is not some area of your life where sin is not oppressing you. Don't tell me there's not some area of your life where you don't need to be bought back. And you might look at me and you might say, oh my, come on, for real. Punk rock music? I mean, how infantile, how childish, how ridiculous. Beloved, my sin might look easy to overcome for you, but your sin might look easy to overcome for me. You've got to sort this out between you and the Lord. And you've got to take those things, those things that hold you captive, and you know what they are. I don't have to tell you what they are. You need to be purchased. You need to accept that price. Jesus Christ, your Passover has paid the redemption price for you. I want you to notice those next two words, in full. Amen. Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. He didn't say it's paid part way. It's 50. No, he paid it all on the cross. You cannot add to the price paid. But you can what? Accept. You can accept it. You, 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 can, you can no more add to the redemption price paid for you than Adam and Eve could have made something the day after uh, the, 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 their, their first day there in Eden. Think of it. Here's Adam and Eve. It's the next day and they're looking at the wonderful things that God has created and, and uh, it's the Sabbath and, and so Adam stoops down and he, he, he makes a little bird out of dust and he... He looks at his bird and he throws it up in the air and he's a fly bird and the thing goes, blah. And I can imagine God walking into this fictitious scenario and saying, Adam, I'm sorry, um, what are you doing? Well, God, I'm, I'm trying to create something. I'm, I'm going to make something like you did. I'm going to add to your work of creation. And I, I can just imagine God saying something like, Adam, you can't add to this, but you can enjoy it. Why couldn't he add to it? It was finished. Right? The creation was finished. It is it's finished. It's done. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And, and he could have easily said to Adam, he could have easily said to Eve, listen, you don't add to my creation. You enjoy it. Amen. So too with redemption. Beloved, you don't add to your redemption. You enjoy it. Amen. It's finished. The Sabbath is a sign of both creation and redemption. You can accept Christ's purchase of you. You can enter into the Sabbath rest of redemption. You can see, cease to work to gain God's favor. Knowing that Christ has already purchased that favor for you. Wouldn't you accept that price just now? Won't, won't you serve Him with your whole heart? You know, there's a, an interesting thing about purchasing something. 
because what's of value to you may not be of value to me. Right? You might be walking through a store and see a nice pair of shoes sitting there on the rack and go over and say, oh, that's a good-looking pair of shoes, and turn it over and say, 200 bucks, no problem. I might look at that same pair of shoes and say they're not worth 20 bucks. Right? But if you pay 200 it's worth 200 to you. I was married April 4th, 1999, and, and uh, getting ready for the wedding, my wife was preparing um, all of the necessary arrangements. I mean, I, I asked her to marry me. I don't recommend this, by the way, um, but it's true. You know how you just know when God is uh, leading. I knew my wife for six weeks, and I asked her to marry me. It's a true story. I knew. I knew she was the one. You know, it's like the old pickup line in the, in the youth Sabbath school. They say, oh, you know, God told me you're the one I'm supposed to marry. And he told me he would tell you later. <laughs> now, we, I asked her to marry me after six weeks, true, but then we did have to wait. You know, I didn't want to rush things. I wanted to be sure. You know, I wanted to be sure she was the right one. So we waited six months, and, and during that six months of, of engagement, we were getting things ready, and, and you know how the ladies can be, you know, I, I would have gotten married in the backyard, right? And I, the bridesmaids color, cummerbund, any of that, just sweetie, as long as at the end of the day we're married, you, whatever, just, just do it. So we went to this uh, place where we were going to rent a tuxedo in downtown Napa Valley. My wife is from uh, Northern California. And so we went to this men's store in downtown Napa Valley. Now, Napa Valley is very shay, very hip, very cutting edge. And, and so we went to this men's store, and immediately Violet, Violetta went in. She began to visit with the lady there about the tuxedos and the rental prices. And so it was a men's store. I began to look around just at the various offerings that they had. And I saw a nice jacket, a wool blazer, a good-looking blazer. And, and I'm the kind of person that before I decide if I like something, I look at the price. That's a good piece of shopping advice, ladies. <laughs> Look at the price before you decide if you like it. And so I looked at it and I said, well, I, I may like that. And so I looked at the price and I went, oh, surely this is a misprint. Surely there's a typo here. So I, I looked at the, the, the jacket behind. There were several hanging. I looked at the one behind and said the same thing. So I looked at the one behind that, same thing. So I, I turned around to look at the back of the jacket to see if there was a jet pack there or something. <laughs> Maybe there was some Kevlar material inside that made it bulletproof. I mean, I... Five thousand dollars. I looked at the, the... I knew immediately we were not renting tuxedos here. My wife was still up negotiating, so I look at the wool. It's made of wool. Wool. So I went over to the shirts, true story, I went over to the shirts, and they had some shirts, some nice white cotton shirts that look exactly like this one, $600. <laughs> I began to wonder if there was anything I could afford in the store. The belts were $500. The socks were only $72 a pair black wool socks just like those that you see right there and I paid I think six dollars for three of these at Target <laughs> beloved seventy two dollars I was thinking to myself for real then it dawned on me don't miss this don't miss this it must be the case that people go into a store like that and buy those things I mean the store is open I, I mean, I suppose it must be the case that someone comes in there and says, oh, it's a good-looking blazer. Try it on, you know, you do it. Maybe, maybe the wife's there. Say, sweetie, what, what do you think of this? What do you think? Oh, that looks nice on you, sweetie. That'd go good with your khaki pants. Yeah, I kind of like it too. And so, oh, sweetie, it's only $5,000. I think we'll get two of them. Now, now, we kind of laugh at that, but friends, it must be the case that people spend that kind of money for those things. Otherwise, how could stores like that be open? Now, beloved, here's the point. The value of that jacket is determined by the one who's willing to pay the price. I'm not paying that for that jacket. Are you with me? I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, that is not worth it to me. But if somebody goes in and pays $5,000 for that jacket, it's worth it to them. Now think about this. The price of something is entirely 
subjective. The value of something is entirely subjective. Well, who determines it? The purchaser. The purchaser. Huh. So if, if I paid $50 for my shoes and you think they're not worth a nickel, it doesn't bother me. It's worth it to me. You with me? So God bought you back. And He gave you the Sabbath as a sign that you're purchased property. He created you, yes, but He also redeemed you. And He purchased you with His blood. Beloved, what is God worth? That's a tough one to answer, but I think it would be safe to say that God is worth an infinite amount of something. You comfortable with that? God is worth an infinite amount of something. When Jesus cried out on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As far as Jesus was concerned, he was going to be eternally separated from his Father. He thought that sin was so offensive, so terrible, that this was going to be the end of it, and yet he went through with it anyway. What is the message of the cross? In a sentence, the message of the cross must be that God, and Christ was God as we learned this morning, that God valued sinful humanity more than His own existence. That's the message of the cross. God valued sinful humanity more than His own existence. Or to put it another way, God would rather go to hell for you than live in heaven without you. Now, you might not feel like you're worth that. But here's the beauty of it all. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Your feelings have nothing to do with it. He goes, well, I don't feel like I'm worth much. And frankly, let me just be very honest with you here. Some of your parents have failed you. Not all of them, of course. But some of you have parents who have failed you. I know that story. I've never met my biological father. He, he, he was gone. Three weeks old, gone. I had a second dad. He was a very abusive man. Gone by the time I was 10 years old. Sometimes parents are toxic and don't do the right things. Some of you may have parents like that who've told you, whether overtly or covertly, that you're not worth much. And you believed it. Some of you have friends, maybe. At least you thought they were friends. And their friendship goes something like this. You can be our friend if you fill in the blank. Ha! Some kind of friendship that is. I had a whole lot of those friends. You know what happened when I became a Christian? They disappeared. This is not friendship. This is simple economics. They, they like me as long as I provide something in the relationship. The moment I stop providing something, they're gone. What about the media, ladies? If you don't look just like this, you're not worth as much as those that do. So eating disorders and other things and depression and, and, and uh, self-worth problems begin to arise because people feel like they're not worth as much if they don't look a certain way or act a cer- drive a certain car. A good friend of mine, Matt Parra, likes to say that many people become slaves to other people's expectations of them. And some of us become slaves to other people's estimations of our value. But friends, the message of redemption, the message of the Sabbath, the message of the Bible is that God has determined your value. And he did it without your consent, by the way. You don't have to agree to it. God already did it. It's done. Price paid. What was the price? It was an infinite price. You don't believe me? The price paid for our redemption? The infinite sacrifice. Notice those two words. The price paid for our redemption? The infinite sacrifice of our Heavenly Father in giving His Son to die for us, 
should give us exalted conceptions of what we may become through Christ. Don't let others talk you down. Let Christ talk you up. As the inspired Apostle John beheld the, in, the height, the depth, the breadth of the Father's love toward the perishing race, he was filled with adoration and reverence and failing to find suitable language in which to express the greatness and tenderness of this love. He called upon the world to behold it. He simply said, Behold what manner of love the Father God hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I loved what Pastor Diop said this morning. Only God has the prerogative to declare us His sons and daughters. What a value. Notice that. What a value this places upon man. Do you know what your value is? Your value is equal with and consistent with the worth of God. That's what you're worth. Through transgression, the sons of man became subjects of Satan. Satan. Through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the sons of Adam may become the sons of God. Can someone say amen? Amen. And notice it's by faith. It's by what, everyone? It's by faith. You accept it. You receive it. You, You can't add to it. By assuming human nature, Christ elevates humanity. Fallen men are placed where through connection with Christ they may indeed become worthy of the name sons of God. Beloved, an infinitely high price has been paid for you. The message of the cross is that God valued you. Sometimes we say, maybe you've heard this before, Christ would have come for only one. Have you heard that? It's not true. He would have come for none. He would have come even if no one accepted it. Because friends, the price paid for you is less about you and more about God and who He is. God has paid an infinitely high price for you. He has placed a price tag on you. And someone might look up that price tag and say, overpriced. Overpriced. Beloved, what other people think about you is none of your business. Did you hear what I said? What other people think about you is none of your business. One of my all-time favorite statements from the writings of Ellen White says, we should not be concerned. We should not be anxious, wondering what God thinks of us. We should ask only this question. What does God think of Christ, my substitute? I think that God thinks pretty highly of His Son. How about you? Oh, yeah. You can receive that purchase price. You can't add to it. You can serve Him with all your heart after you've accepted it. You can obey the letter and the Spirit after you've accepted it. But you're not going to do anything to earn it. You receive it by faith. I want to ask two questions as we close this evening. Number one, has this message been clear, yes or no? This message has been clear. Raise your hand. It's been clear. Okay? Good. Beloved, every time you keep the Sabbath now, you remember, God created me. God paid an infinitely high price for me. The Sabbath will become a joy. I guarantee it. I promise. It won't become a day of don'ts. It will be a day of Christ. And here's the second thing. I'm wondering if if there's a young person here who'd like to accept the purchase price paid for them. What I mean by that, I want to be very specific, is you want to place yourself on the side of Christ by publicly professing that you accept His death as your death. His burial is your burial and His resurrection is your resurrection. And the fantastically wonderful ceremony that God has committed to us to symbolize His death, burial, and resurrection is none other than baptism. That's what baptism means. It means I accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as the price paid for me. 
and I publicly profess that I am on the side of Christ. I accept the purchase price. Perhaps some of you have already been baptized, but you have not been faithful to your baptismal covenant. I don't mean you've fallen. We all fall at times. I'm talking about you've turned your back on your baptismal covenant. And you feel like you need to do it again. You need to re-initiate that covenant with Christ. You want to accept his purchase price of you. My good friend Matt Minicus is going to come sing us a song. He's going to sing the Lord a song. We're going to listen in. The song is called Jesus Paid It All. I want you to, I want you to hear that. Jesus paid it all. And God is going to move on the heart of some young person here tonight to accept that purchase price. And to say, yes, it's time. It's time to be baptized. Don't feel like you're going to go get ready before you get baptized. You come to Christ just as you are. You can come right now. As Matt sings, I want to invite you, if, if that's a decision you want to make, not a doubt in my mind, someone's going to make that decision. You come forward as Matt sings. Kneel with me here at the front. Okay? I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. And Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Thank you, Robin. Praise the Lord. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Kneel, Can change the leopard spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in Him complete. I'll lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Let's all sing together. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Father in heaven This evening we have heard the rest of the story Sabbath, not as a day of don'ts, 
but as a day of creation, a day of redemption, a day of Christ. Father, we understand tonight biblically the purchase price, the redemption price. We've been bought back from the land of the enemy, from the captor. Father, sin, Satan, and death has oppressed us. Many of us have been living in the land of the enemy. Many of us still are living in the land of the enemy. Christ is calling us to Himself. He says, what more can I do? I've paid the price for you in full. And I invite you to come to me. Come accept the purchase price paid. You cannot add to it. You cannot diminish it. But you can receive it. So, Father, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we have come. Some have come to the front, received this purchase price, expressed their faith in that price by saying, I need to be baptized. I need to enter into the ceremony of baptism. Put myself on the side of Christ. Father, it's likely there's a young person here who didn't respond. Oh, Lord, help them to see that now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. It's not safe nor wise to wait until tomorrow. The world is calling, temptation is calling, pleasure is calling. And then there's another voice, and lo, Christ is calling. Father, tonight, may that person who's struggling even now hear the voice of Christ calling them, come. As a minister of the gospel, I believe in my heart of hearts there's another person here who needs to respond, at least one. We're going to sing again. Jesus paid it all. And as we sing together, you say, it's me. This appeal was extended for me. You hear the call of Christ. You hear the call of his purchase price paid for you. And for once, tonight, don't worry about tomorrow. You worry about right now. You're going to say, Jesus, I come. I'm coming. Or place myself on your side. As Matt sings the final verse, and then we sing the chorus together. I want you to know that this appeal was extended for you. If you if you're wrestling right now, this appeal is for you. You come forward just now. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete Amen. I'll lay my trophies down All down at Jesus' feet Jesus paid it all all to him I owe. Sin that left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin that left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow
Father, tonight we've heard your voice. Somehow through the foolishness of preaching and the idiosyncrasies of Pastor Asherick, somehow cutting through the clutter, we've heard your voice. And your voice has said, my son, my daughter, I did it for you. Tonight, Father, we want to glory in the purchase price paid for our redemption. Not to add to it, not to diminish, but to receive it. I'm wondering if there are others out there who have already been baptized, but tonight in a sign of solidarity and re-consecration and recommitment, they want to raise their hand to heaven and say, tonight I understand anew the purchase price paid for me. You raise your hand. You see those hands, Lord. Those are your, those are your children's hands. Father, thank you. You have heard us tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com Our address is Hope Media Ministry P.O. Box 752 Ada, Michigan 49301 You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com That's hopevideo.com